Hello everyone and welcome to our final reinsurance power panel of 2025. In this edition, we'll be looking at capital, secondary perils, geopolitical volatility and more. And to take us on that journey, we welcome back Ian Reynolds, Director of Third Party Capital at Peakery Hong Kong, and Peter Wilkie, Specialty Lead at BMS Group UK. Uh, so welcome both, and with global reinsurance capital remaining a robust and alternative capital continuing to flow into the market, let's start by asking how are reinsurers and sedants balancing traditional and non-traditional capacity in structuring multi-year and indeed multi-peril programs? And are indeed we seeing new innovations in, in hybrid or, or blended solutions? Uh, Ian, I'll start with you. Uh, yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, look, I think... There's always a place um, for third-party capital, of course, I would say that. But I think the art here is to be very clear what it is you're trying to achieve with third-party capital. Um, there are many legitimate reasons for employing it. You can be managing risk. You can be supporting growth, uh, but perhaps even just targeting fee income. All of these are legitimate things to be doing as long as you're clear about what it is that you're trying to achieve. And there's always room for a balance between the two, I think. Yeah, is that something that you would agree with, uh, Peter? There's a, a balance to be struck? Yeah, definitely. And I think although there are areas where the non-traditional and traditional sides cross over, there are also areas of specialization or, or where the appetites are slightly different. So when you talk about multi-year, for example, we're seeing maybe a little bit more appetite on the non-traditional side for multi-year deals. When it comes to multi-peril and especially unmodeled perils, um, that's still something which we, we're mainly going to see uh, on the traditional side. So, yeah, I think that there is a mix to be had. And I think that it makes sense um, for buyers to balance the two because, as I say, there, there are some differences between them. Of course, something that's been very different in recent years is those climate-driven secondary perils, so severe convective storms, wildfires, floods, etc. They're generating those outside losses in both mature and emerging markets. So, Peter, how are reinsurers recalibrating their catastrophe models, their risk appetite, their pricing for these exposures? And indeed, are attachment points and event definitions evolving in response? Yeah, I think that the modelling side is evolving. And um, to take the example of wildfire, because we obviously had a big incident at the start of this year, um, and new models have just been released, vendor models. Um, I don't know whether they're still fully trusted by reinsurers. Um, it's a difficult peril to model because of the fact that it can be man-made or, or it can be naturally occurring. So I don't think there's still full trust in them. I think there is development happening, but it doesn't happen at, at a particularly fast pace. Um, and then in terms of how that affects attachment points and other terms and conditions, well, we have this um, issue with now in the sense that there's more capacity in the market. And so I think that even if, uh, as a reinsurer, these secondary perils might cause you to wish to push up attachment points probably that happened a couple of years ago already and to push it further from where you are now is unlikely um, and if anything probably we see the tension pushing them down rather than up yeah, is, is that something that you agree with as well in that idea that that things may be moved already a couple of years ago certainly things moved and i think i mean we we rightly identify that um the emergence of Frequency losses in the, in the CAT space was one of the driving forces behind increased retentions uh, in the treaty in 2023. I think it's worth pointing out that actually the retrocession market did the same thing perhaps 12 months earlier, and we haven't seen a lot of give um, in the retrocession market. So I think that discipline is holding. And I uh, perhaps I would say that as a reinsurer, but I think the attachment points are probably where they should be. Um, but clearly, we do see pressure from brokers who are trying to change that. Of course, it's not just catastrophes that are impacting lost trends. We're seeing geopolitical volatility, inflation, social inflation, all having an impact as well. So, Ian, how are reinsurers are approaching aggregate covers now, reinstatement provisions and, and event caps in both property and casualty treaty negotiations? And indeed, are, are buyers able to secure more flexible terms or is discipline holding firm? I think... There's a lot of variation by, by line of business, as you point out, by geography. Um, but in the whole, I think it's pretty much the same story. There are all manner of drivers of, of uncertainty in the market. And uh, a lot of reinsurers are pretty comfortable with where attachment points have landed. So um, again, we have to acknowledge that there's pressure from brokers for that to change. But so far, discipline has been holding. 
Okay, and, and, and Peter, would you agree in terms of uh, the, the same tensions sort of exist on both sides? Exactly right. Yeah, I think so. I think that whether we're talking about geopolitical volatility, social inflation, or um, natural catastrophe and secondary perils, I think that the fact is that there is more capital in the market now. And I think that regardless of those concerns, it's unlikely that there's going to be sort of hardening of, of any terms and conditions or pricing. However, I'd also agree with Ian that so far, I think that um, there's been a lot of discipline showed this year. I think that there will be more flexibility at 1-1. Um, I think that we expect to be able to get get more things done, but certainly not everything and certainly not easily. I think it'll be very differentiated by clients and, and by area of business. Well, I'm throwing cat losses at you. I'm throwing volatility at you. Let's talk about cyber events. That seems like it's next on the list. Of course, there have been a lot of recent cyber events, systemic risk concerns as well. So, Peter, how are reinsurers and brokers now structuring cyber reinsurance, both quota share and, and excess of loss, to address aggregation, silent cyber and accumulation risk? And are, are there new exclusions or sublimits emerging for critical infrastructure or systemic exposures? Yeah, I mean, of course, cyber's always had the worry around systemic exposure. And so I think that that's no different. It's all, always been on the front of reinsurers and insurers' minds. Um, CrowdStrike was a particularly uh, notable event because of the fact that it was non-malicious in nature, but it but it was systemic. So that served as a bit of a wake-up call, I think, and um, and certainly led to a certain tightening in, in terms and conditions. But overall, probably what it did more is accelerate the already uh, the movement we're already seeing from quota share and stop loss to non-proportional covers. Um, so we've seen more event covers bought in the last 24 months. Um, and I think that that trend is, is likely to continue as buyers look more to cover really the large, uh, large events and, and some tail risk as opposed to being on proportional cover. And is that acceleration something that you've observed as well, Ian? Yes, absolutely. I, I, I completely agree with what Peter was saying. Um, we've seen perhaps less appetite for proportional cover. And um, as capacity moves towards excess of loss, it's moved away from aggregate and more towards uh, current type covers, um, which we would like to think is, a, you know, is a, uh, an indication of a maturing market. Um, that said, let's be honest, there's still some quite prominent cyber attacks in the news, which clearly haven't been covered. So um, I think even on the origination side, there's still a lot of work to be done in this space. Well, no conversation in 2025 would be complete without some discussion about artificial intelligence. Indeed, as AI and advanced analytics become more embedded in underwriting claims, portfolio management, Ian, what do you think are the most promising applications for reinsurers in, in risk selection, pricing, capital optimization? And indeed, how is technology changing that broker, reinsurer, client dynamic and the speed of renewals? Yeah, uh, we have to talk about AI, don't we? Um, look, I think that the, the most obvious application of AI in for, for risk bearers, at least in this market, um, is that the, even the simplest models are language-based, and so there is uh, the most obvious application is in wording reviews. Um, and I think almost all reinsurers are working on that in, in one way or another. Um, my, my background is quantitative, so um, personally what I feel is that, that the most obvious or the most promising use of AI in our industry would be in improving a lot of our optimization work really improving the, the fidelity of the inputs and the outputs uh, in, in how we employ optimization algorithms in the industry, which have, have occasionally been pretty crude in the past. Okay. And, and, and Peter, from, from your perspective, what are you seeing that the greatest advancements around tech? Yeah, I think in the long run, I think it's that modeling of tail risk, um, which creates the potential for more capital optimization. I think that's the biggest opportunity. Um, we'd also like to see progress in modeling some currently unmodelable perils. Um, so particularly in the specialty areas um, and some of the secondary perils that we spoke about earlier. It'd be great to see better modeling around that if we can get that um, from AI. As to whether it's increasing the speed 
um, of dealings in the market at the moment, I, I'm not so sure. I think that we might be a little way off. I think that it, it can have some efficiencies around um, research, analytics, uh, wordings, as Ian says. But I, I wouldn't say there's a particularly notable increase in the moment in, in terms of the speed of which we can get things done. Well, huge thanks to these gentlemen and to all of our panellists for their contributions throughout the year. Remember that we'll be back with more in 2026 alongside our daily reinsurance news coverage on our website. So keep it right here at Reinsurance Business TV.